Hey, church. Happy February. It is Black History Month in the United States of America. I am so grateful uh, for 2024. I hope already that this year has been bringing you um, new beginnings, uh, new perspectives, fresh vistas. I am so grateful for so many Black men and women and leaders in this country who have impacted and influenced my life in ways that I can't even begin to describe. And it is our honor and our privilege this month to celebrate uh, so many incredible figures in the Black community here in our country. And I pray wherever you are watching this, wherever in the world you are watching this, that uh, you garner strength and encouragement and life from the minutes and moments that we share. I am shooting this before the Super Bowl. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Super Bowl, it's basically our version of the World Cup final in the United States of America. And that is the worst parallel of all time. Um, because as a kid, I grew up not knowing much about the World Cup. I know, it's gross, it's ridiculous. Shout out to the Netflix documentary on the World Cup. It is so good, by the way. But the Super Bowl has come and gone. But before, as I'm shooting this, it has not yet. And I want to make a prediction. I believe Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens will, by now, while we're watching this, be celebrating a Super Bowl win. So we'll find out if I was accurate and right when this airs. But nonetheless, happy month of February all over the world. I hope you enjoyed the minutes and moments we shared around Romans chapter 8. I am continually encouraged by the book of Romans. I think the Roman Christians, for me, those following the way of Jesus in ancient Rome, speak so much to me. You, you may not know this, but uh, ancient Rome was probably only 10 square miles, and there was nearly a million people living in 10 square miles in ancient time. Think about that. It was the concentration of New York City, so to speak. It was the cultural epicenter of the world. And so often when I read Paul's words to uh, Roman Jesus followers, I find uh, so much harbor and haven and life and energy and strength in these words. And I hope that we will do that again in the month of February. We're now kind of going back in the text. We've spent time in Romans 8 for four weeks. I'd like us to rewind and go back to Romans 5. I must admit before we jump in, Romans 5 has become one of the hallmark portions and passages of, the, of Scripture in my entire life. It has changed me. Uh, one of the ways to know what Romans 5 is all about, 5 is the number of grace in Scripture, and would you know it, what we now call Romans chapter 5, it wasn't originally chapter 5, it was just the letter to Romans following the way of Jesus, but now we call it chapter 5, and chapter 5 is the great chapter of grace, maybe in all of Scripture. I think it's safe to say that Martin Luther in the uh, old Reformation of the Church, the Protestant Reformation. It really was Romans 5 that was the catalyst. Uh, it was so catalytic in his thinking, his paradigm, his writing, and his thesis. And so we're going to go there. We're going to look at only two verses at the outset here of the month of February. And I'm going to title the next 20 minutes that we share together, A Perfect Relationship with God. That's kind of a wild concept. Now, if you're watching this somehow, some way, and you are completely unsure of what to do with the divine, with God, even specifically Jesus, you wouldn't consider yourself a religious person, you wouldn't consider yourself a church person, you wouldn't consider yourself a Bible person, I am so glad that you're here. Because I think in these next 20 minutes, it'll give you an opportunity to consider who we are at Church Home, what we believe, what we're about. And uh, I want to introduce this thought to you, that you, whoever you are watching this, wherever you are watching this, can actually have a perfect relationship with God. Now, that brings me to my marriage, which is not a perfect relationship, but oh, I wish it was. But of course, Chelsea makes it not perfect. And I've been working on her. I've been challenging her, confronting her. I'm just kidding. No, I am the one in our 20, almost 25-year marriage that continually makes it broken, plagued, and flawed. But what if I told you, with the person you love the most, that you could have a perfect relationship? Would you be interested? 
Wouldn't you be enticed? Wouldn't you be allured? Wouldn't you be like, whoa, 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 tell me more. Now let's take it a step further. What if I told you in the outset of this presentation and this speech that you, whoever you are, whatever you believe, that you have access to a perfect relationship with God. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you will be perfect, but that your connection with God will be complete, whole, flawless, and unbroken and unending. What if you could have a perfect relationship with God? Much has been made over the thousands of years that people have been worshiping Jesus. Much has been made about our relationship with him. Um, oftentimes in moments like these, preachers and talkers and thinkers like me tell you things of that you're to do, assignments, homework, if you will, things that you've got to accomplish to improve, increase, enhance your relationship with God. What if I told you Jesus already did it? What if I told you that the most formidable, considerable, important posture that you could ever hold or have in your relationship to the divine is simply acceptance, receptivity, and in that sense, a posture of ease and rest. So I want to read Romans chapter 5 and the first couple of verses to you. And I want to read it to you. I'll be reading from my phone, but I want to read it to you um, in what we now call the Passion Translation. It's a newer translation here in the United States of America, and it it says this in verse one, in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us, and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means that now we can enjoy true and lasting peace with God. All because of one reason, what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Now our faith generates, verse two, sorry, our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness, this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. This marvelous kindness, I'm going to say it again, that has given us a perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us, that has given us, not earned us, but given us a perfect relationship with God. I believe your relationship with God can be perfect through two ways that are outlined in these two verses. You have perfect peace with God and you have perfect access with God. In that sense, your relationship with God through the work and effort and even morality of Jesus can give you peace and access. Now, I want to define peace and access for you. And I realize the next 15 minutes or less are going to be insufficient to really describe comprehensively and exhaustively the implications of these two verses that quite literally, whether we're aware of it or not, have changed the belief system that I currently sit in. It's changed in some cases the order of the world. I have perfect peace and I have perfect access with God no matter what my performance is. I'm going to say that again because we need to soak in that just for a moment. Just saturate in this thought. You have a perfect relationship with God. What do I mean? You have perfect peace and perfect access to the creator of heaven and earth. No matter what your performance is. In other words, his performance has gifted you and me Perfect peace and perfect access perpetually. How wild is that? Now, so much of the fodder in culture today and on the World Wide Web seems to insinuate, indicate, and even sometimes very clearly declare that unless 
you are morally transcendent or morally elevated, unless you hold doors open and tip really big and use nice words and are gracious and kind and always congenial and always comforting and empathetic, that, that in fact you, 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 you can't be okay with the divine and you must not be a good person and only good people do good things and bad people do bad things as if the world was that black and white, as if in fact that was the end all be all. But the mystery of God is revealed to us in Romans chapter 5 that through what God in physical, visible form did in the person of Jesus on the cross for some six hours as he hung there suffocating in his own blood and dead and buried in a rich man's tomb, resurrected on the third day to declare, in fact, that he has victory over death itself because he is God, he is the divine, that that work of sacrifice, the Bible uses this big word propitiation, which is to say there is a taking of our place for all the selfish, self-serving, manipulative, sinful, evil, maniacal things you and I have both done. Jesus took our punishment, took our place, and now has afforded us, given us opportunity to simply accept a perfect, unbroken, unending, eternal relationship with God. Now, if you asked me, Judah, what are you really about? What is this church home thing really about? Is this about tech? Is this about um, offerings and tithes? Is this about power and renown? No, it's, it's not. It's about what I just described, that I believe the greatest story ever told has nothing to do with your moral capacity or mine, but it has everything to do with what God did for you and me when he put on flesh and bone some 2,000 years ago and for 33 years lived a sinless, perfectly kind, wonderful, flawless life and yet died like the worst of criminals and then rose again on the third day to say, essentially, I told you so. Since that moment, friends, you've got to admit, I have never seen a PR firm do what the story of Jesus has done throughout the corridors of history in the ages of time. In fact, I believe it's transcendent and supernatural, and I believe it is the act of God. The Torah has been preserved in ways we can't even begin to describe scientifically. It doesn't even make sense. Its accuracy after 2,000 years is documented. It's remarkable. I sat with an atheist recently and was able to tell him the remarkable renown of the sacred scripture. Ah, oh, it's like any other book. In fact, it's not, but it's not. No other religious book can claim preservation. Scientifically proven, astronomical, not human preservation. How can you describe the Dead Sea Scrolls and the discovery and what it indicated and made clear to you and me. How many dictators and empires have sought to destroy permanently and eradicate the Torah and the New Testament, and yet it remains somehow mysteriously? Because I believe it is what we call simply the story of God. Now, whether you're aware of this or not, that's the story you live in. You are living right now, not just in your story or my story or even our story, but his story history, the story of God himself. You are an indication of God, God, the creator, the architect, the designer, and the artist. I saw a sunset recently, unlike I'd ever seen the deep orange and the deep reds uh, cascading over the open waters of the ocean in Los Angeles. And I was dumbfounded by one Tuesday evening sunset. That's just one sunset amongst a million trillion sunsets that the great, great artist of the ages declares his glory through. Now, the truth is, it's all around us, isn't it? His handiwork, his magnificence, his beauty, his majesty. How can we know this great artist and architect and God? Well, he came close. I love how Eugene Peterson says that he, he moved into the neighborhood in the person of Jesus. And like I said, he lived a sinless life. He was perfect. The miracles he did, 
born in a barn in Bethlehem in the middle of nowhere. And then we see him as a toddler being worshipped by scientists, if you will, magi, men who studied the mystical ways of the stars, and yet they find him at some two, three years old, and they bow down to a toddler. What? And then we see him at 12 in the synagogue, on the steps of the synagogue, confounding the most brightest religious minds of his era. And then fast forward to 30, he makes alcohol at a party and people celebrate how good the wine is that he makes. And then for the next three years, he opens blind eyes. He heals lame bodies. He resurrects the dead. He cares for the broken and the marginalized and the overlooked. And then he submits and yields to a dictator dictatorship that claims him and whips him and mocks him and beats him and strips him and hangs him on a middle cross between two infamous criminals. And while he hangs there for six hours, he only has words that can move you to your core, such as, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. He speaks to onlookers to take care of his mother. Who is this wonderful man? And then just like he promised years before, he rises again on the third day, buried in Joseph, the rich man's tomb, appearing to more than a thousand people and levitates into the clouds and promises he will come again. What is church home about? That, just that. That some 2000 years later, that story gives my body chills and rocks the planet as we know it. Who is this Jesus? I believe him to be the superhero that we crave so desperately, even in the movies that we produce and make? Where did we come up with this concept of saving, delivering? Because it's baked into our system, because we know we need it, and the Savior has already come. So at Church Home, we seek to propagate and popularize the story more and more and more. And the story only gets the, I should say, the story only gets gooder the more I sink into it. It is richer and thicker and more beautiful than I could have ever, ever comprehended. Well, let's read this verse again. Our, our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. He now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. We now enjoy true and lasting peace. True and lasting peace. The true and lasting peace spoken of is a Greek word called Irene, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but it means to be joined in the construction community, which I'm not a part of. I wish I was. I wish I could. The carpentry industry, it's called a dovetail joint. In fact, I think I'm correct in saying this, the dovetail joint is the strongest joint in construction. It is literally, if you will, it's, it's this. And the picture of peace in the Greek literally means we have been joined, a dove tail joined. Of course, the imagery speaks of a dove. Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because in scripture, dove plays a remarkable role. Do you remember in the ship that Noah built, the ark, before rain had ever hit the planet? Rain comes so hard and strong, a flood hits the world, whether or not you believe this is metaphor or not, it still paints a beautiful portrait. The dove, when the flood ceases, brings an olive branch back to Noah, a dove that I'm sure that I'm assured was in the ark and on the ark, and he releases the dove. The dove comes back with an olive branch as if to say, there is now peace on earth. Jesus is baptized, if you remember, fast forward thousands of years, he's baptized in the Jordan River, and when he comes out of the water, a, a dove comes out of nowhere, heaven, and lights upon him. Well, what is the dove? The dove is a portrait of the Spirit. We are joined to God in spirit. We are joined to God through his Spirit form. He comes and he makes his home in us. Even right now, while you're watching this program, you might feel warm. You might feel vibes. You might feel like, wow, these, something about these words matter to me. That's the spirit form of God meeting you through the miracle of technology in your bedroom, in your workplace, in your lunchroom, on the run you're on, on the walk you're on, and the park bench you sit at. That's the spirit form of God. 
And the same dove that came to Noah and the same dove that came to Jesus is the dove that comes to you. And what's the message of the dove? Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Well, Judah, I don't see peace on earth. What is this peace you speak of? In fact, I, while we are recording this, one of the most horrific wars we have ever witnessed continues to go on and on, and there is loss of life. Whatever your opinions might be of war, is there any amongst us who desires for human life to be taken? I don't think so. So where's this peace you speak of? Well, this peace is a joining with the spirit and soul of man to God. And it's a perfect peace. It's an unbroken communion and connection. One of the things, and this is why the scripture says we, we literally, this means we can enjoy true and lasting peace or true and lasting jointness with God, that we are like this with God. Now, this is fascinating. We now have a union with God that cannot be broken. And in that, the scripture reveals, Paul speaks openly to ancient Jesus followers in Rome. He says, you're living in 10 square miles with more than a million people. Can you imagine the calamity? Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the crime? Can you imagine the challenges and difficulties of a million people living in, in 10 square miles in antiquity. And he says, listen, in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil, you are joined to God through the work of Jesus and the morals of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And so that union with God can give you peace in the midst of the storm, calm in the midst of the storm. That's a perfect relationship with God. This with you and God cannot be pulled apart. Now, Many people believe that if I do bad, this is what happens. But that's not scripture. That's not what Paul says. Paul's saying to ancient Christians and now to modern ones, hey, this cannot be broken. Just like in the construction company. In fact, I read an article this morning that says, actually, when it comes to a, a dovetail joint, oftentimes you don't need glue. The dovetail joint itself holds itself because of its nature. And that's the portrait we have of being joined. That's the peace we have, that this cannot be pulled apart. I know we mean well, but we say things like, I want to grow closer to God in 2024. You can't get any closer than this. You are joined to God. You have peace with God. I have so much more to say there. We'll talk more about that. But let me read verse 2, and then we will conclude. It says, our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect, there it is, a perfect relationship with, with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us when we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. This idea of access, says in verse two, this guarantees us permanent access. I think you have a perfect relationship with God because you have perfect peace and perfect access. This idea of access means you've been ushered into the presence of royalty, but it also means this, haven and harbor, haven and harbor. That access gives you haven and harbor. The scripture says his name is like a strong tower you can run into and be safe. You have haven and harbor with God. Your body will deteriorate just like mine. I'm 45 now, and the things that I feel in the morning are not normal. Shout out to Epsom, Epsom Salt Bath which I do nearly every morning because of the aches and pains that I've experienced, even from playing basketball as a high school student in this country. And I'm thinking, man, my bones and body and joints and ligaments are not as young as they used to be. Listen, we're all going to age and age will happen. And we all need reading glasses and things of the such. But, but this idea of access to God, connection to God, relationship to God only grows more and more fresh and young with the passing days. It doesn't age. It grows truer and stronger and eternal. This life is not the end. It's only the beginning of what will be eternal life. You have haven and harbor with God. I don't know if you know the story, and I'm going to say this very quickly, so bear with me, but there's a story of Jonah and the whale. And the story goes that Jonah is called to be a prophet to a city called Nineveh, and he doesn't want to go, so he hops on a ship going the other direction. 
and a huge storm breaks out on the open sea, and guess what happens? The captain of the ship believes that everyone's going to die. Jonah knows what's happening. The elements themselves are raging against his disobedience and his misdirection, and he says to the captain of the ship, throw me overboard, and the storm will cease. Sure enough, they throw Jonah overboard. Now, he doesn't die. He ends up being swallowed by a whale and spit out on the shores of Nineveh. But it's all a picture of Jesus. Your life is like that ship in a storm. Instead of you having to jump into the waters and into the belly of a whale to calm the storm, Jesus does it for you. He jumps into the stormy waters. Imagine it with me. And what you are left with is calm. And like that belly of a whale, Jesus was buried in a tomb. Just like that whale spit out Jonah on the shores of Nineveh, so Jesus rose again. That's the picture. Jesus dove in to the calamity, chaos, and judgment that was for you because of your disobedience and mine. And he calmed the storm. And now we have haven. Now we have harbor. And lastly, I end with this. What incredible joy bursts forth within us, verse 2 says, as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. This is my takeaway for you today as we conclude. This is my assignment to you or homework, as much as I hate the term homework and assignment. Will you keep on celebrating the position we have been given because of Jesus? One of the meanings here of access is a military term that says, hold your position, hold your position. It's funny because the Bible speaks of fighting the good fight of faith. The fight that we fight is to stay in that posture of receptivity, that you are perfect and flawless before God. See, because what's going to happen? You turn this message off and you might do something mean. You might do something that's contrary to who you want to be and who you really are and who you say you are. You know, moral breakdown. You know, inconsistency. Sin, error, wrong, selfishness, manipulation. I mean, I, the other day I was like, I think I'm manipulating my dog. I mean, what kind of guy manipulates his own little dog? You know, his puppy, right? It's like, I think I'm being manipulated with my puppy. Like, what do you do when you realize, like, oh, my word, I am, I'm lying. I'm cheating. I'm stealing. I'm lustful. I'm arrogant. I'm prideful. I'm, oh, oh, God, what do I do? Guess what we've got to do? We've got to continue on celebrating the position we have, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. The truth is my perfect relationship with God was never predicated upon my performance. It was always and forever predicated upon Jesus' performance. And his poor performance is finished. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. Whole, complete, done, solved, perfect, flawless, righteous. You have that standing with God. Now, whatever is in front of you for the rest of this day, whether you're watching this at night or in the morning, I pray you sleep soundly. You're watching it in the morning. I pray you walk throughout your day with confidence because you, yes, you, by simply accepting, not earning or deserving, but accepting the work of Jesus, you have a perfect relationship with him. Perfect peace, perfect access. So let's celebrate that today. If you get a chance, Grab a coffee with a friend, a new friend, a coworker, and tell them what you have because of Jesus. Let's keep on celebrating the position we have been given through Jesus. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the opportunity to rehearse again the greatest gift we will ever receive, a relationship with you, unbroken, unending and eternal. We need haven. We need harbor. We need that dovetail joint. Remind us again that our connection to you is unbroken, unmoved, and it's not going anywhere. Encourage my friends watching this now all over the world. 
If you're listening to my voice right now and you would like to receive, that's it, receive the gift of Jesus. That is, he did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. You want to receive that gift? Just say out loud right now, I receive. I receive you, Jesus. I receive you. Now, continue on celebrating the perfect relationship with God you now have forever and ever without end. Once again, happy 2024. So excited. We're going to continue this series from Romans chapter five. Just think we've only been through two verses. We're going to keep going through more verses in Romans chapter five. And I think it'll be life-giving and encouraging to you. See you next week. Love you, church. Over.